Hello and welcome. I am Gohar Raza and you are watching Eureka, a program that brings you face to face with the brilliant minds, the scientists of the country. Welcome, Dr. Raja Raman, to yes. Rajya Sabha channel. Pleasure I'm to be very here. thankful that you could spare some time to come and talk to us. Thank you. Thanks. Do you remember those days? Who were your ideals as a child? Well, interestingly, apart from my father and mother, who were, of course, uh, people, ideals, my real idol those days was Pandit Ji, Jawaharlal Nehru. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru? Absolutely. I was brought up to the sound of his voice. I used to go to Red Fort, stand far away and hear him. He had an hypnotic effect on me and on, of course, millions of our countrymen. So he was really my real inspiration for all my childhood. Once you, I'm sorry, I'm interjecting. Once you look back, what was the, the uh, magnetic force that attracted you? Well, we were all very conscious of the fact that we have just become independent. Independence came when I was eight or nine years old. So I remember the pre... And so we were all very excited by it, and his voice, and he was the symbol of that emergence. Uh, so not just I, but probably lots of people in my generation felt that we were now starting on a new adventure, of which we would be the soldiers. So he was the voice of hope for the younger generation. Absolutely. Anger, his own, everything. I mean, he was the hope, voice of hope. For the, uh, Gandhiji was the voice of our morality. He was like, uh, he was like a father. He was the father of the nation. But Panditji was the man actually doing it and was taking us into the modern world. Uh, and the future. And the future. And he was very committed to science and technology. Uh, did you have any sense at that time that science and technology is going to be the future of the country? That I didn't know, but I certainly knew there were changes because in my real childhood days, uh, scientific careers or academic careers, although respected, were notionally respected, but were really not very strongly supported. Gradually, even by the time I came into college and went beyond, it became more and more acceptable for children of middle class families to take on science careers, to teach, to join Atomic Energy Board, you know, various uh, streams of strings of things, which was not possible before, in part because the government had in fact set up salary structures that were finally comparable uh, to what the government servants were. So people, my father couldn't do it in his days. As a professor, he earned one third of what he would have gotten in the government. So finally, he had to go to the government. Because there was so much family pressure, his mother, his father. So uh, one was conscious already that things are moving. One was conscious that the IITs had started. And there was room for, and one knew a few role models already in my days, people four or five years older to me, who instead of necessarily going and joining the IAS, were joining these science. Uh... You were a very good student, and your father kept on educating himself to the extent that it started working with the legendary figure called Mahalalam Des, yes. who shaped the country. He was one of the pillar of the country, and today a large number of institutions are thankful to him that he conceived them. Absolutely. Uh, do you remember uh, Mahala Lambes? Did you ever had well, a chance to interact with him? Later in life I did. Once when I was a graduate student in the US, my father had come to New York and he took me to Mahala Lambes, was there. I remember even Rani Ji making me sit near her, his wife, mm -hmm. saying, Beta, kaise ho, and so on. But in my childhood days, we didn't even know the difference between Mahala Lambes and office. We thought it was the same thing. My father would come back at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, uh, and we didn't quite know what was going on. It was only later when I was in college and when I was abroad, I realized the number of things he had done. And now I know that our country became the envy of the world even then in the field of statistics because of Mahalan Abbas. It uh, is because of him it's that we are one of the best in right. statistics right. in and the world. And there was great demand even then for people like C.R. Rao and so on to go outside because there were, there were no statisticians. So will you, uh, will you agree with me if I say that that generation had some kind of IV or injection being given by its larger society, like heroes like Gandhi and Nehru, yes. and at levels of institution, education sector, 
or even within the family and it was it was something natural to to imbibe those values absolutely and i am concerned that this is not quite happening to the same extent nowadays uh, yeah, it's very, very much so. And many people Do in you my think generation... So? Yes, that it is not happening? Well, other things are happening. There is a problem? Well, I think young people are, are and even their parents, are understandably less idealistic. Uh, they are not, they, they are honest people, but they really believe that you have to look after yourself. And that is the lesson being taught uh, basically by the parents nowadays to children. Uh, they don't say you become uh, Rana Pratap, they say instead you make sure you get this job, get that job, make sure. So I think the values are changing, including within the family. Uh, so this is part and parcel, I suppose, of the changes. In our days, that was not so at all. Uh, so building the nation, building the society, building the humanity is not the objective for today's generation, or maybe it is synchronous with making money. So that if you make money, you are building the world. Partly it is that feeling. And also there is a rebound on this. There are people now coming back towards old values, having pursued the career route and realizing it's not satisfactory. So we see a large number of Indians, including people from abroad, coming back and trying to do something in our villages, trying to build some roads, build some organizations. So there is a rebound back. But the basic school, college level, I'm afraid it's rather mercenary these days. How do you remember your school? My school was a very good school. I went to what was called Madrasi school in Delhi those days. It's the only South Indian school in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I went there because I learned to read and write Tamil, which even people in Madras didn't know how to do those days because they were going to English schools. It was a very, very good lower middle class, middle class school. And we always used to get good ranks and so on, study very hard, beat on the knuckles if you didn't. So it was a good school I was very happy about. And uh, our teachers were grossly underpaid, uh, but they used to take care of these 2,000 people under them. It was a school I admired, and one of the inspiring teachers I've ever had, most inspired, was my mathematics teacher in school. Uh, and poor man lived in some, now when I, mean, I think back on it, it was appalling the conditions in which he lived. He and come, he was brilliant. Brilliant, and you would come teaching. back and show energy in the classroom after God knows what horrors at home before he came, and after he goes back in the evening. Paisa nahi hai, this nahi hai, that nahi, you know. So that, that was the power of building the nation yeah, and right. idealism. That's right. I'll have to take a break at the moment, but we'll come back soon. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Uh, Professor, we were discussing that how idealism was a driving force for building the nation. And this objective was broken by maybe parents, maybe society, into smaller objectives like excellence in uh, education, doing well, teachers teaching uh, with sincerity, uh, because they were probably contributing to nation building at that point of time. But uh, coming to your subject, when did you choose uh, physics as your uh, well, subject? That's a very uninspiring story, I'm afraid, because I really got into it accidentally. I was a very good exam chap. I used to know how to score. And I scored the <laughs> highest marks, beat every record everywhere. But you also knew subject. Well, I knew enough of it to do that. But, and I was good in mathematics, so that sort of happened simultaneously. But as I said, my real interests those days were in directly serving the nation. I thought, uh, and I didn't know about politics. Middle class Indians don't go into politics those days. So I thought I would join the IAS and serve the nation. That was my plan. But I kept doing well in mathematics and physics, and everybody and his brother told me, look, this is what you should be doing. I even remember meeting uh, Mr. Rajagopalachari. Was, was there the pressure from the family to do no, IAS? No, or? No, 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 whatsoever. No. You None. decided on your own? On my own, this from is childhood. And for me, it was the next exam. 11th class, my first hour, BSc, my first hour, MA, my first hour, IAS, my first hour. You see, it seemed like a continuation. <laughs> Very limited you know, vision at that time. But I thought that would also serve the country. And it would have if we joined that, the people there did serve the country. But many people told me, no, no, but the science thing you have, the physics, mathematics talent is more unusual. You should pursue that. So, and then also scholarship offers came from abroad, world, got out. And so that is how I ended up becoming a physicist by default. And it is really was a story of uh, gradually growing love, as they say. As I began to practice physics, uh, not just uh, something clever that I could do in exams, but try to really think of it as an animal out there, the physical world, which I must understand. And getting to know physicists, the, I had a great fortune of meeting some of the topmost physicists in the world just by virtue of being in that place. 
we'll come to that yeah. uh, for sure uh, because that is yeah. very interesting phase of your life right. uh, what i wanted to ask you was that during those days science was in thing science was respected a lot and within science physics was considered yes. to be the mother of sciences at that time did that uh, discourse of in the air influence you to go into physics oh, very much so. some of the brilliant minds yes during that period have gone to oh, physics that part is certainly true when i finished school and so on there was no question that i would do physics honors when that was the queen of the subject although deep down we really were mathematicians most indian physicists theoretical physicists they were they were really including omi jahangir baba oh, or cv raman or cv raman was anything. a very special case in the sense that he was an indian who was interested in the physical world he was curious as a cat he wanted to know kya hai sab ho raha why is this why is that most of our contemporaries were much more of a mathematical and inward orientation this has been one of the problems about our indian science background is that by nature we are not that curious about the outside world as a group now it's changing a little so we tended to be very good mathematicians good very good philosophers very good theorists uh, raman was an exception he was an experimentalist because he really wanted to know what was going on out there uh, so we weren't like that i mean so i have to tell the truth in this right. so i really got into physics from a mathematician's point of view to be able to understand the logic of it and so forth but it turned out that is what you should do in theoretical physics it just that you're looking at the logic of the physical world and not of just something inside your head uh so so it really was a sort of accidental transition into something that i learned later on to respect enormously and when did you get interested in nuclear physics well my starting field was in phd was nuclear physics because my advisor was a great was it because uh, you were given uh, that was this, basically this a area to work on yes because i was a good little boy from india i wanted to work for the best man <laughs> even then it was not the love of the subject i must tell it was because he was working on it that i got into it the love came much later it's like love in an arranged marriage it comes later but when it's there it's just, it survives <laughs> so it took me time uh but so i went into it because he was the greatest man there and everybody said he was good enough to take me worked for them and learned how brilliant people think that was all very exciting and if you wanted to do nuclear physics i would do nuclear physics that's the way it started and your guide got nobel prize he got the by nobel. the time you finished your phd not then it turned out he was one of these people who had contributed a lot but his nobel took a little longer a few years after he finished uh, in fact we were just written a joint paper together after my phd and that when the month the paper came out the nobel prize also happened so it got a lot of but more than that he was really one of the father figures of the world of physics uh, yeah. by his very nature yeah uh, hans peter was in the united states of and america and even in the world he was german origin person yeah. uh, people would tell you that he was in fact in the second half of the previous century probably the most respected physicist uh, because of his wide reach because of his personality he was always a father figure i think he was born as a father figure i used to joke with him <laughs> uh, so yeah. uh, that was a great experience he was also very much a, uh, a very important advisor to various presidents of the united states so when i went in there he was already the science advisor to eisenhower and uh, uh, later on to kennedy so in those things he showed him tremendous judgment and calmness when all the oppenheimer disputes and so on were taking place so he was a highly respected figure and i learned things about, about like that from him how to be objective how to be calm how to understand issues not necessarily take the populist view but look at things your own way and subsequently i got to meet feynman and all these other people because they all would go in and out of his office all the time super brilliant people i mean it just makes you want to cry how clever they were and how unassuming they were considering how clever they were so those things very quickly brought me down to earth yeah so you you thought that you were the best right. in this school and yes. college yeah. and when you enter into a different arena Absolutely. of mental activity yeah. and intellectual activity yeah. right. then you realize that yeah. much greater yes. people are there Absolutely. and you learn and imbibe learn a lot imbibe of values from them you learn from them and you also realize where you are in that it makes you really humble and didn't destroy me because there was still i was learning things from them but it that is what attracted me finally the love came from the love of the kind of precision and power of their thinking and the modesty that went with it you know and the honesty the honesty honesty that integrity, is integrity intellectual integrity intellectual they wouldn't integrity. let the thing go by if they felt it was even slightly uncertain doubtful and 
that is what scientific research is all about. Well, in my view, at least in my kind of thing, there are other things in other branches of science which you need more. Uh, for instance, much of science is experimental science, as it should be. There you need a different kind of persistence and a sense of feeling for the system. You interacted with best of the mind in the world uh, because you were, uh, you were a student to such a brilliant person. Um, how do you recollect your memories of this interaction with the best of the mind in America and then thinking about India that we do not have this environment in the country. How did that affect you? Well, that affected me when I came back because I came back after about 10 years after having worked in the US after my PhD. I worked in the Institute for Advanced Study where Einstein used to be and my office was three doors removed from where his office would be and so on. It really got, then I came back to India. So I expected things would be different and, and it has been a struggle here in some sense. When and did you take the decision that I'll come back to I India? I did that actually twice. As they say, I quit smoking 30 times. Similarly, I took the decision twice. Once I came in 63, right after my PhD, and I found, I, sim I joined Tata Institute. They were good enough to give me a good job. But I found that I was always being drawn, uh, d distracted by what was happening out in the street. Unemployed by people, I would go to slums, I would see what goes on in the slums of Bombay. And I just could not, could not get back to physics. And that is when I met several, some of our political leaders and social workers saying, look, should I stop physics and do this? They all said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't, you don't realize what you have, you must. So then I went back to the US again. I wrote to my professor saying, I'm not able to concentrate on physics here because in my view, more important things are going on here. They said, you come back. So I went back, they offered me a position. Then 10 years later, I again came back because I was going to be here and I was going to do things. So I came a second time 10 years later. Then I, since then I've been part of the Indian science world and all these things that you say, these differences were very much there. There are many, many brilliant people here whom I met also over the decades, but there was a great deal of that absence of that kind of uh, intellectual integrity or lack of uh, in, in, intellectual modesty. Many of those values were not here and not here even now sufficiently. We have a large number of people now who are like that. The number has grown enormously from the time when I came, when the number of professional scientists, physicists was very small, countable. Now there are hundreds, bright, good people with the right sense of values and so on. So things are definitely changing in India enormously in the last 10 years. Uh, but the freedom movement values which you imbibed in the school and during that period at, at home kept on pulling you back to yes, India absolutely. every time you went yeah. out. And even today, you don't regret coming back Not to India. Not at all. People ask me that. Well, I don't at all regret. I uh, what, used to get angry every other day when I'm here. But that's a different matter. That's <laughs> angry within your own family. So for me, life would have had really no meaning abroad. Short visits are different. Sabbatical trips are different. The discussion will continue. I have to take a small break at the moment. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back. Welcome back. Uh, we were discussing your career as a physicist and the people who shaped you as a physicist not as a person or a human being obviously the human values which you imbibed always chased you and brought you back to India but a person like professor or dr. Hans Bithe uh, I'm sure he was a magnetic personality as one reads about him and uh, whoever probably he touched would have become a brilliant physicist with a few exceptions <laughs> <laughs> you are being modest we were talking about modesty and the values that you imbibe you're being what modest uh, you have achieved a lot i'm sure there have been moments of eureka in life when did you think that this is when i have hit the jackpot of knowledge I did not have any specific moment like that. It was a gradual growth and there were periods when I was doing things which fortuitously happened to be of great interest to people. So those have made a larger impact. But practically every piece of work was something new. 
and in between pieces of work, I would be rather like these poets and writers in a state of real despair, going around kicking walls, not knowing what I'm going to do next. It was very much a creative process. So it, more or less, so every one of those are my children, those papers. So I'm not able to pick one over the other. A large number, <laughs> a very large number of children well, yeah. you have. Yeah, yes. lot, yeah. And, and a lot of love went into the creation of that child, so to speak, into those papers. So, because it was theoretical, I, I, one of my characteristics of my own uh, publications is that every research paper contained in it a fair amount of the explanation of the subject also. I could never stop being a teacher. That's what I loved most. So even my research papers had a teaching component in them. And that is what one of, one of the things that actually, I think, made people appreciate some of them. Uh, reviews and even non-reviews, papers like this. So there were several. Uh, I have wrote a book from uh, 30 years sitting in Bangalore, which has essentially been read by people all over the world now. It's, uh, it's a research level book. And I can go to Yugoslavia, and there are people coming out of the woodwork saying, ah, I remember it. So, so those things happen because of your desire to teach, to communicate. To so communicate one the, the science. science. And one of the things that I enjoyed most in India is the fact that I teach here. I taught not only students, I taught my colleagues, my younger colleagues, generations of people have taught in summer school, winter school, year school, war school. And all over the world. All over the world. You have been yeah. delivering such a large number of lectures every every year. Uh, and you, you are a great traveler when I was looking at your <laughs> CV. Yeah. You travel a lot and I give lectures. Uh, which of the committees that you have served, you thought that there you have made a real dent? Uh, pugwash? Well, not so much pugwash. There is one uh, panel of which I was a co-chair until recently. It's called the Panel on Fissile Materials. Right. And its purpose, the purpose of that whole panel is to do scientific work towards the protection, safety, and ultimately getting rid of the materials that go into making nuclear weapons of which there's such a huge amount in the world now, it's absurd. There are 200,000 weapons worth of materials sitting around. So for 10 years, we have been it studying. It bothers you as a human being? Oh, very much so. Nuclear weapons bother me as a human being very much. And some of the anti-nuclear weapon people sometimes think that I'm a turncoat because I talk to the people who make them. I talk to the generals. <laughs> they would rather spit at them. But I feel that standing in a corner holding a play card is good, is well driven, but doesn't change anything. So I wanted to engage with people who actually believe in it. And the people who believe that we need weapons are also decent people. They are all family men, their wives and children. So we can't call all of them evil. And I found it very profitable to talk to them. And maybe they're doing an evil job yeah. under certain circumstances. Certain circumstances or they don't understand the issues properly. They're doing a job that is given to them. Some of them are, all of them are patriotic. Twenty percent of the brilliant, most brilliant minds, scientists are even now yes. involved in making uh, Weapon, weapons, absolutely. nuclear weapons especially. That is very worrying. Yeah, it's today. very, very worrying. And, uh, uh, and also in our country, we have recent nuclear power, last 10, 15 years. The pride that goes with it, as, a, as if to be proud of one's scientific accomplishments is one thing. To be proud of one's muscularity using weapons is another. So I have never really, I've always written in the public realm. Saying Another question, very natural question from a nuclear scientist of your stage would be that on the one hand, after Fukushima, you have Germany which has taken a decision as a nation to give up nuclear technology altogether, completely. And very soon, 2021, yeah. that's what they are saying. And here is India and China who are going in in a big way for nuclear technology. Which side... Uh, would you stand as a scientist? Well, for I think it depends on the country. I think Germany is done a, has a, done a great service to the world by turning off its nuclear thing because it's going to develop alternatives with its technology and technological power, which all of us can benefit from. Indian situation and to some extent Chinese is different. A large fraction of our people even now don't have electricity. 100,000 villages in India have no electricity, and 30 something 30 million households don't have around the world. So we need power of various kinds. And so the requirement of need of our power has to be matched against the possible hazards. I have looked into the hazards quite a bit. And I personally believe that nuclear hazards are not as strong as people feel. It's because radioactivity is an unknown, invisible, odorless you know, thing which does peculiar, creepy things to you. People are very scared of it. 
and those photographs from Hiroshima. Including Kosambi. Yeah. Kosambi has written against yes. nuclear Absolutely. Uh, power and nuclear technology. Right. So people are understandably scared, but that is where I think our science community has a, has a responsibility to first of all win the trust of the public, which it has not done properly, so that when they say, look, this stuff is safe, believe me, I've looked at it, it is safe, public will buy it. Currently, the Buddhists, they'll say that, of course, they're part of that group. So one of the things we have not done well is to win the trust of the public on these matters. When we, have, when we get a Nobel Prize, everybody admires them, so all that is different. But uh, in the nuclear arena, there is a trust gap, not only in India, all over the world. What I would like to uh, ask in the end is that you have switched over from theoretical, pure theoretical physics to very close to experimental physics of uh, high energy physics area and then public policy is, is one of the areas which you are very keenly following at the moment. How do you see the future of science in India? I think the future is very good. As I said, with every succeeding generation, the number of good professional scientists in India has grown. I'm not too worried about the fact that we haven't gotten Nobel Prizes recently. That really doesn't matter as much as how many good uh, professional scientists you have. That community is growing. So their self-peer reviews are better. I think there's a very good future ahead. Plus, the interaction with the outside world has become easier, thanks to the internet. So you're not isolated like you used to be. So I think the future is very good, very much so. And uh, I think it will happen, uh, regardless of budget cuts under over. It's going to Are you worried about budget cut? No, no, not too much. I think it will all, sometimes there's too much, sometimes there's too little. The longer average these things co come out in the wash. So I think Indian science will do very well in the future. Would you like to sign off by giving a message to the younger generation? My biggest message is please be true to yourself. Don't say things that you don't believe in. There are lots of things you do not understand because you are young. Try to find out about them. And if you feel a deep conviction, say it. But don't say things because you are expected to. Don't wear a uniform because you are asked to. Wear what you like to wear. Wear what you like to wear. Don't accept things just because you are accepted to accept them. Um, may I, on your behalf, uh, promise our viewers that if they have any query or question you would be happy to answer delighted yes thank you for watching eureka we'll come back next week with one more as fascinating a personality as dr raja raman is thank you for giving up giving us so much of time thanks a lot thank you